So we are live now and uh, good evening everyone and welcome to another one of the live sessions of Voyages into the Past, Arotit Prabaho. Today we take pride in hosting Dr. Gajendran Ayathurai, Professor and Researcher at the Center for Modern Indian Studies, Göttingen University, Germany. His research interest lies in the field of history and anthropology of modern India. The problem of caste and why, how, and in what ways privileged castes hegemonize and perpetuate marginality and the anti-caste cultural and political histories of the marginalized animate his research, publishing and teaching interests. The historical anthropology of indentured labor from South Asia during colonialism and the Indian diaspora in colonial and post-colonial times are also part of his present and future projects. Currently, he is engaged in the study of Tamil Buddhism in South Indian cities. 73 years down the line of independence, the oppressive caste system still proliferates every aspect of the Indian society. Hence, to strike at its roots and educate us more on the topic, Dr. Gajendra Ayathurai will speak on the theme when the foundation myth of India is on Varna and Jati, dislodging caste and gender oppression and engaging casteless and gender free practice. So, without further ado, over to you, sir. Excellent. Um, thank you for that kind introduction, Riti. And, and, and uh, it's, it's fantastic you and Himadri and other friends are organizing this. Um, uh, a voyage uh, into the past series of talks. Um, is, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that um, um, history students in Kolkata and others, uh, you know, from other disciplines of social sciences and humanities are coming together to raise important um, um, questions about the, what is being taught and how new themes have to be brought in all that. And so, um, it's a very difficult time for all of us across the world. Um, uh, COVID-19, you know, uh, it is, it is, uh, COVID-19 has really affected us, and but we are all bouncing back. And I, I appreciate the way you have taken the lead in showing um, um, uh, you know, how can we scholarly engage with important themes. Um, and I appreciate you forthrightly speaking about the uh, problem of caste in India. Uh, good. So this is the title, when the foundation myth of India is uh, Varna and Jati, dislodging caste and gender oppression and engaging caste and gender free practice. Um, 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 first, I'm going to uh, talk about the theme of, uh, you know, why I've chosen very quickly in a couple of minutes. And um, caste, like Riti was saying, it has been an oppression. It is not something that we can celebrate at large. So, um, but usually the moment somebody drops the word caste, we different react in a different way. One of the ways is that, oh, everybody, you know, reservation, it is ruined India because that's how people start. Um, that's one way, which is a very problematic way. That means we are overlooking how caste was in the medieval time and ancient time. So it's, uh, reservation policy is a very recent development, right? So. Uh, you, as if reservation invented caste, that's how people speak, which is wrong. That's one side. On the other hand, uh, we also have, uh, you know, people are reacting to caste in a different way. You see, it's it's part of our culture, it's part of our religion, therefore how, you know, it's one of the pillars of India. Is it so? We need to raise this question. And uh, also caste has gone outside India now for more than 200 years. That's my research. I just finished my field work in the Caribbean and soon uh, my study will be out, uh, my understanding of Indians in the Caribbean. Um, so where are you from? For example, Peter van der Veer and uh, Stephen Metterwork talked about Hinduism in the Caribbean in the 90s, which they looked at as Brahminism. They used the word Brahminism, which was to my surprise because Indians started identifying themselves as Brahmins and some Brahminical practices came about. Peter van der Veer and Stephen Metterwork wrote about it in the 90s. That's one. Uh, and then we have recently, I don't know what the, uh, some of you have followed, in the US there's a massive uh, lawsuit is on uh, with the software company, on the software company called Cisco. A couple of our Bombay IAT and suddenly found out their colleague, Indian colleague was from a lower caste or an untouchable, started inserting him and so on. Now there's a huge cases going on. So casteism, it's 
cost cost easier. Ayurveda is out now, um, out India. It's flourishing well in the U.S. And recently, um, in 2014, there was a massive report in England called Cost in Britain. Uh, Professor Mina Danda and uh, Professor David Moose um, and, and et al. and others have uh, written this report called Cost in Britain uh, in 2014. So it's, it's globalized. So um, um, regarding the Cisco case, uh, Amit, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, Amar Divakar, yes, Amar Divakar has written uh, a, a piece on this. It's online, uh, it's available. Uh, please have a look at it to understand cost discrimination suit um, on Cisco in the US, Amar Divakar. Um, there, people are talking about um, global Brahmanism now. This is something of Brahman. So, that means Brahmanical ideas from the Caribbean, it has moved across. It's flourishing with me. So, cost is globalized now. Um, so, how do we understand? So, that's what this uh, and the history of it, uh, the global reach, all of them we need to critically understand. We have a long way to go. We are beginning to scratch. Um, you know, people are doing um, serious work in India now across the globe also. And new researchers from PhD students are coming up on the problem of cost. Uh, and that is welcomeable. And I'm, I'm so glad um, Riti and Himadri and other friends are taking the lead in, in engaging with this question instead of pushing it to the back burner, you know. Oh, we, let's, let, that's not a big issue, that kind of attitude. That is wrong. And I appreciate you all again for taking this lead. Okay, so um, here is the plan. So first I want to, in my talk, I want to, three things I want to do. First is I'm going to talk about modes of caste, race, and gender enforcement in India, right? I see this as modes of in enforcement. I call this modes of caste enforcement. Three modes I see. One is civil society, how people in civil society bring about ideas of caste institution and so on. And then what does the state do? Uh, the second mode of enforcement is the state. And third is, what does the academy do? How do we theorize? How do we, how do we produce texts and so on on the problem of cost? So, um, these are the three modes of enforcement of caste, as I call it. That I'm going to talk about in some detail. And then secondly, um, the, on the one hand, you have cost being legitimized. On the other hand, we have cultural resistance against cost also is happening. You know, there are, are you guys are many of your history students, what I call archives of the oppressed. People have been writing. It's not like what Gayatri Spivak, uh, you know, Chakravarti Spivak said as, a, you know, can this Fabalton speak, which is a very problematic piece. Uh, it is not even being referred by many organic intellectuals. Um, what is what I'm trying to say is that people have been writing uh, for centuries, oppressed uh, people, men and women. So there have been journals in the early 20th century published by women in Tamil Nadu, right? And attacking the problem of caste and gender. So how can you say there was, there was, you know, the campus have often speak. So, that, so I'm talking about a little bit of the archives of the oppressed. That's the second component. And the third is, what do we do, all of us, right? Now, what do we do? How do we, uh, how do we, there was never a golden age in India, a caste-free India, no. Uh, it's only in the present and future is possible through our collective effort, right? And do I have a clear solution? I don't. But I want to be open-minded about this, and collectively we have to do it. And that's my third component. Um, that's the plan for my talk. Okay, well, the, um, um, cast, this is how I write. I'm beginning to write in my articles and book. It's going to be like that. I don't see caste and casteism as different. It's caste stroke casteism. And then Brahmanism. What do I mean by Brahmanism? It has to be theorized. Um, we don't have yet um, uh, um, uh, a clear, uh, serious, ex exclusive sociological, study sociological uh, understanding of, say, casteism. There is no book on casteism yet. There is no book on Brahmanism yet, like we have racism and white racism and all that. Uh, it has to be done. But I, for me, caste, caste is Brahmanism, they're all durable inequalities, you know. Um, I, I borrow this phrase from the book, durable inequality, from Charles Tilly. Uh, and, and there, he, um, uh, he talks about, um, uh, as I say in the slide, four modes of uh, durable inequality, or four, uh, he doesn't call it as mode, four elements, four components of durable inequality. First is exploitation. 
So, for example, race is meant to exploit. Likewise, cost is meant to exploit. And the opportunity hoarding, I have the opportunity, I hold it, I don't want to give it to you. I don't want to share it with you. Second component is of, uh, of this durable inequality is opportunity hoarding. Third is adaptation. I would force you to adapt. I com compel you to adapt, say, racial discrimination or cost discrimination. And then fourth is emulation. After my forcing, you yourself emulate cost. So, so these are the four modes by which cost has come into being. So I'm using Charles Tilly to think about this durable inequality of cost, cost use of brands. Now, another thing I wanted to tell you. So all my slides will be based on references. There will be some interpretation, but mostly I'm going to tell you the books I'm using and the quotes, all of them come from these books. Uh, and of course, I'll tell you exactly how I look at it. That's how I'm going to go about it. Okay, so let me get into the three modes of um, cost enforcement. So the first one, you know, the first door, first um, point, you know, like civil societal enforcement of cost and cost use. So it has, historians point out, as you know, the arrival and rise of Brahmins. So there are some people who question, oh no, Brahmins have been indigenous and so on, but thankfully we have Sanskritists uh, who clearly show um, that there has been sort of Aryan immigration into India, migration into India, and so on, with that cost. That means preceding Brahminism and Brahmins, we have had indigenous communities, Dasas and Dasus, all of them, right? Ancient historians talk about it. So, caste, once the migration of caste based people got it, such as Brahmins, you have the, it is being legitimized within the civil society. Now, how do you do it? None of us, whether it is you know, um, Riti or Himadri, me or anyone else who's listening to me or seeing me, um, we don't know our cause, but yet somehow we are trying to figure out, oh, could this person be that? Could that person be, what do you eat? What is, what is your name? That's how we work it out, right? But all these have come from the societal, the civil societal inventions, myths, stories, fabrications, right? All of them, so fictionalized, uh, you can't figure out cost, yet it is there, ruining our happiness, right? Um, so, cost is basically exclusion. It's not inclusion. Um, it is to exclude. I have to see something different from you. Therefore, I keep you out as low, and I will never let you go above me. So, I remain as the highest. You remain as low or lowest. That way, you know, it's an exclusion. So, Foucault talks about strategies of exclusion, right, in one of his words. So, um, I apply this to, to, to tell caste is nothing but a strategy of exclusion that has come from the civil society. And along with that, what has to be done is, it's not a woman who would have invented caste, clearly a male, therefore patriarchal power, right? Patriarchal that I call, you know, there are people are, some ancient historians have used the word Brahminical power, I'm narrowing down, Brahmin male power, because it would also include Brahmin women and so on. But where does it start from? So I'm very curious. My hunch is right now, it's clearly based on the text, Sanskrit text and so on, this Brahmin male power that is, and it's insular, it's inward, it's backward looking, it's exclusive, right, patriarchal power. And it has come from the civil society. And then bodily violence, horrendous bodily violence is happening in India in the name of caste. I have some slides in my other talks that have shown the whole family is stripped naked and insulted. How do we do this to our own fellow beings? All in the name of caste. In, in the name of religion, right? So bodily violence is a very crucial component of legitimizing caste. That's what I mean. So therefore, Kshatriya power, Vashapa, we say Kshatriya power, Brahmin power like that, and we should have power to legitimize this kind of violence, which is wrong. So essentially, on you know, this kind of scheme, caste is on caste system, essentially what we see is that women and non-Brahmins are biologically inferiorized. Nobody can be equal to a Brahmin. No woman, even a Brahmin woman, can never be equal to a man. Texts say that, right? So they are inferiorized, not just by normatively first, but it is biologized, right? Biologically, like Foucault would say, again, biopower, you know, and biopolitics, right? Uh, body is uh, excluded and, and separated and humiliated. That's how um, it is uh, essentialized and so on, inferior, biologically inferiorized. And then self ghettoization I, by calling myself as the highest, I ghettoize myself, right? Comes from the word ghetto, ghetto, self, so, a slum. I self ghettoize In the name of ghettoizing you, I become, I exclude myself. 
In other words, there is dehumanization. We all say like, oh, look at this woman or man attacked by caste religion. Well, they are dehumanizing her or him. No, we need to reconceptualize and understand when I impose causism on others, I self dehumanize myself, right? I lose my humanity. I lose my human sense by calling you as inferior, as you know, racially or caste wise or gender wise. So it's self dehumanization, self ghettoization by trying to create slum for the people I oppress, right? So we need to make this conceptual transformation to understand self ghettoizing mentality of a casteist male, be it a Brahmin or Shakya, whoever it is. Okay, so, uh, and then, so these are all norms, civil societal norms, but have been naturalized. That's what I call normativization and naturalization based on what? On myth, on fiction, fabrication, all that. And then myth of Brahminism plays a very vital role. Brahminism as a motor force, right? The idea of Purush, um, Brahman was born, from, was born from head and you know, Kshatriya from arms and then Vaishya from the thighs and Shudra from the feet. Complete, complete nonsense, right? But we have been forced to believe in that through what I call exploitation, opportunity holding, adaptation and integration. Okay, so complete fiction has come to ruin us for close to 2000 years now. That's civil society. Now state, such a norm has to be legitimized Unless there is a power to legitimize, my idea of caste will not be legitimized. Who does it? The state. That's where the state becomes, as I said, the enforcer of Brahminical myths. When I say Brahminical, it is definitely Brahmin male as a core, but also who play along with the Brahmins. That's what I mean. It's, a thing. it's, it's an expansive concept, Brahminical, right? Whoever is going to emulate could be called as Brahminical. Of course, uh, Brahmin is at the core, but Others, non-Brahmins who would emulate such casteism should be also categorized as Brahminical behavior. Right. So the state is used to enforce such Brahminical myths. So rules and regulations are created, right? Oh, contract, social contract, as if there is a contract between Brahmins and Kshatriyas, neat, decent contract. What social contract? The Hobbesian term. No, this is not a contract. This is not an egalitarian contract. This is an oppressive imposition, right? And state does it. So we have the, the Brahmins live in the best locality called, a Sanskrit text called Agrahara. Only Brahmins, nobody else can go. By the way, there are still Agraharas in India. Brahma Deyam, all of them were created to uh, self ghettoize uh, Brahmins self ghettoize themselves. Uh, and what happens is this phrase is important, spatial segregation. So village is divided, right? It's not anonymous. We clearly know which caste groups live in a village. Who created? The gods created? The goddesses created? People who indulged in casteism created it. And it's time we redraw the village structure. So there is no Gandhian romanticization of village Ram Rajya. Complete nonsense, right? It's caste Rajya. Okay, so a Brahminical Rajya. So it has got to come to an end after all this um, damage that we've been prone to. So state played a very crucial role in this legitimization of uh, Brahminical uh, village Rajya. Um, so bodily violence, state is legitimized. Look at some of the terms that I'm using, drawn. Drawn means dragging the people who resist constitution. They are tied to the wheel or of a chariot, drawn on the road. Imagine uh, one of you or me being drawn on the road like a wood. Okay, that is drawn. And they don't leave you because you resisted caste. They don't leave you at that level. After drawing you on the street like a wood, they disemboweled you. That means they cut open your tummy, took out your intestines because you resisted caste. It's called disembowelment. After that, they did not leave you quartering. Quartering means they cut your thumbs, they cut your um, thumbs, and they cut your uh, arms, they cut your legs. That's called quartering. All this was done to legitimize caste. State played a crucial role. Please read Manu Dharma Shastra. And I teach this, therefore I know at least 11 body parts could be cut, all to protect caste. That's what Manu says, um, and um, Manu Dharma Shpriti legitimizes. So many Brahminical tests also legitimize this. Uh, so that's state. That's the second one. The third is academy. Okay, well, how does academy, how does it do? Right? Sanskrit myths were celebrated by Brahminical texts. Like I said, famous Manu Smriti. Our Vedas, our, our, our Puranas, our epics. All of them have to be re-looked, re-examined. What do these texts, our epics, everybody
everybody has a, a, a very important friend of mine, epigraphist in the US. The other day in our discussion said, Ramayana Mahabharata would have been very important tools to push casteism across India, right? So that's, we celebrate as religious, godly, God is on so on. But do we interrogate the casteism that would, we would be unconsciously or consciously? Consciously, we may not, but unconsciously we are accepting casteism through this ethics. Do we interrogate? So it's very important for us to be, that's why I'm putting this here, all the smritis, Vedas, Puranas, epics, all of them have to be re-looked into. And, and then how they all legitimized, and, and by the way, they also, because of the legitimation of these texts, non-Brahminical literary traditions, women's traditions, and all of them have been pushed aside, destroyed. Um, there are Sanskrit texts which decry and ridicule and insult non-Sanskritic texts. That means they are produced by non-Brahmins. So non-Brahmin literary traditions, non-Brahmin linguistic traditions were ridiculed and oppressed by the Brahminical groups, right? So it's high time we So the academy legitimized in the ancient time, in the medieval time, and in the modern time. Um, it's very important. So the so all okay. That's the three mo modes of enforcement. I'm going to stop there by saying. Um, so we have three levels of enforcement. Civil society creates it, but it depends on the state to enforce. The second component comes in, mode of enforce, second mode of enforcement. And the third, the academy also legitimizes both the civil societal norms uh, and practices as well as uh, the state society, state um, norms and practices, right? Uh, academy legitimizes. So this triangular legitimization of casteism, Brahminism, we need to understand. Now, to substantiate what I'm saying, um, this book, some of you would know. This book really stunned me when it was out, and, and, and I have it here. I use it um, often. So, Johannes Broncos, How the Brahmins Won, From Alexander to the Kutkas. So, I, I know this is very, you know, cluttered, but um, these are all quotes from the same book, okay? Uh, please do read. And so, the, none of these are my words from this slide. So they are in quotes. So let's quickly go over before I move to the next slide. So Brahminism, Johannes Bronkert says, Brahminism, written bracket, the religion of the Veda and those who identified with it. Who are those? That is the culture carried by and embodied in the Brahmins. So Brahminism, he uses the word Brahminism and directly pins down, pins down that as a creation of the Brahmins. And he says, who are Brahmins? He explains, a group of people who emphasize their own purity. Not others. That's why I am pure, all of you are dirty. Whatever you may shower and this and that, no, you can never be equal to me as a pure person. That's how the argument. That's how he says that. Then the Brahmins derive their livelihood and special position in society from their close association with the local rulers. You see, the second mode of enforcement comes in. They depend on the rulers to legitimize their ideas of Brahmins. Right? So a Brahmin man would have, would have invented this idea. Suddenly, okay, I am superior, I'm the best, everybody else is the worst. And then he woos a ruler who legitimates the second mode of enforcement. You see, the rulers and then uh, legitimate. So, Brahmins were the ones most suited to establish and maintain links with higher realms. What are those higher realms? Nobody knows. So, that's how it is said, heaven or uh, whatever. They were the ones to advise rulers. Nobody else can advise a ruler, right? A Shudra can never imagine a woman, a Brahmin woman, advising a ruler. Come on. Because she doesn't have a lobe of brain, you see, like me, the male. So that's how the texts were legitimized, right? So uh, they were the best suited to advice on social and political matters. They were the ones to occupy the highest place. Nobody else can occupy the highest place in the social hierarchy. Sanskrit, the sacred language, the sacred language of Brahminism. That's Johannes Broncos' phrase. No other language is equal to Sanskrit. Can you ever insert other languages like this, right? Other languages in India itself and across the world. So no other language is equal to Sanskrit, they say. And then the Brahminical vision of society and politics was not the outcome of political conquest or colonization. We all say, right, the Muslims came and conquered, used sword and so on. That's not the case with the Brahmin uh, male power. Instead, it was a social political ideology. That's what Johannes Bronkos says social political ideology. And what I say here, they are sugarcoating, uh, you know, sugarcoated religio-cultural norms, right? 
their socio political ideology is sugar coated as religio cultural norms. That's what I'm saying. And then the rulers and others who accepted Brahminism accepted, first of all, Brahmins as Brahmins, i.e., essentially the way they thought about themselves. So, whatever I think about me as a Brahmin, you guys have to accept. That's what you're going to um, say. Some. And then the Brahminical literature, this is the third component, mode of enforcement. Academy is the third component of um, mode of enforcement. Here, I, I'm making the entry point through Johannes Broncos. Um, Brahminical literature is primarily exclusively directed at fellow Brahmins. So the Brahminical literature, Brahminical texts that were created not about others, they were created but inferiorized, but primarily about themselves. That's what he is saying. For the Brahmin self-image, com composed to support Brahminical identity and so on. Okay. So Brahminical claims of superiority, right? That's what they wanted to do, he says. And then Brahmins evokes, and then of course, when Alexander came, Alexander came in 326, 345 BCE, before Common Era. I repeat, 326 and 325 BCE, when he came in. And so he had a problem with Brahmin, and probably they were rigid in, in, in the northwest uh, part of India. And Broncos used the word, he slaughtered them for their casteism and so on. So that's all from Johannes Broncos' work, how the Brahmins won, and from Alexander to the Guptas. Now, let's go to the next slide. Um, Broncos on Brahmins. So when I was reading this book, suddenly he connected, Broncos does his connection, connected this, this work on Brahmins with Hitler. I mean, I'm reading this in Germany. I'm talking to you from Germany right now. And I was in a shop, right? I, book, I read books on Hitler. You know, how this guy came about. This is a book about how his everyday life. I want to know how is such a horrendous monster the worst ever monster ever came about. Hitler at Home is the book I'm currently reading. What did he, what sort of image he created and how he lived? And so, and, you know, 70 million people were wiped out during the Second World War. And here you go, Broncos currently suddenly connects Brahmin, Brahminism with Hitler. I was in a shop and in this book he does. And here is the quote, uh, uh, Broncos quote. There, that the Brahmin behavior was not dissimilar to that of another group that was obsessed with the past. The, nation, the uh, National Socialists, the, the, the Nazis of the Third Reich. In the, house, uh, in the house of German art in Munich, opened by Hitler in 1937, there were hundreds of paintings. Not one depicted urban and industrial life. What does this mean is this? In the 1930s, Germany was one of the most industrialized countries in the world. And Hitler, this fellow, he establishes a museum in that he puts things about Roman, German, Roman images or medieval images, nothing about modern. That means he is sitting in a modern world, but thinking about an ancient glorious past as if every German was, um, you know, the best in the world. And he was trying to create that German racist idea, right? You need to talk about the golden age. That's what he did. And this is what Johannes said. But why did he make this connection? I was totally sounds powerful. Then I started thinking, note the interlinkages between Brahminism and Aryanism. Now I thought Hitler wouldn't have had resorted to this racist ideas, but for the institutionalization called Aryanism, which is true Brahminism. So in a way, Nazism relied, I, I argue, which has to be thought about, critically examined, is that Nazism couldn't have come into being had there not been Aryanism, had there not been Brahminism, period. So this interlinkage, we have to clearly think about right more. How Brahminical ideas went into the making of Hitler and the loss of 70 million lives in the Second World War. But here comes our question. Casteism has been, Brahminism has been in India for more than 2,000 years. How many millions would have been wiped out in the name of caste in India? We, the historians and anthropologists and social scientists and humanities persons, have to raise this question, right? We are yet to start, by the way, including me. So we have to work on that. And then comes, and then from there, he moves to the, uh, Johannes talks about Brahminical literature. Brahminical literature, what does it do? The third component, academy, right? As an enforcement, uh, as, as a mode of uh, cost enforcement comes in here, again from Broncos. Brahminical literature presents and, uh, and, ima uh, and image, um, uh, uh, presents an image, uh, okay, and image of an ideal, it presents an image of an ideal world 
that no longer existed. You see, that no longer existed or may never in fact have existed. So Brahminical texts are sort of indulging in a golden age mythification. Golden age fictionalization. Golden age was never there in ancient India. It'll never, it was never there. It is likely to be with all our effort in the future if there is no racism. You know what's happening in the US, right? George Floyd was killed. That no animal would try to would kill the you know way the white man did to George Floyd. We know that. We saw that. We saw the video. Right? And so there has never been a golden age in America. It will be in the future if, if the people come together against racism. Likewise in India, it has never been, um, there was never a golden age. This is what uh, Broncos is trying to tell us, right? So it was fictionalization. The pres presentation of this imagery, imaginary, you know, this imagery world was not uh, only meant to preserve the memory of an idealized past, idealized past, its other equally important purpose was to shape the future in accordance with Brahminical wishes. So the Brahminical wishes, Brahmin male wishes have been legitimized through the Brahminical literature and we have not interrogated it. Almost all the Sanskrit studies in India and in Europe and in, the, in North America have, have not taken the step to critique Brahminical texts from the caste point of view. Here and there they may drop the word but it's not frontally taken in. And that's what Johannes Broncos is telling us to do, right? Uh, how do you, enter? so um, by the way, some Indians also visited during uh, Hitler's time when he was rising in the twenties. You know who is this? It's directly connected with you folks in Bengal. Tagore visited Germany in 1921, 1926, and 30. And he was because he was already, uh, you know, um, um, a Nobel Prize winner and so on. And uh, first world war, German war, Germany was terribly defeated, they all needed somebody to connect with India and then to bring back their, um, uh, you know, presentable situation to the world. So here you go, Tagore visits, 1921, 26, Hitler was raising at that time. I'm curious, what was Tagore's take on uh, Nazis? I'm very curious. This is the, exactly the time right? Hitler was raising. In two, three years, he is going to capture the government in Germany, terribly, and so on. So, and 37, we have the war, right? And does Tagore have, you know, does he have anything to say against Nazism? And what is his position on casteism? I'm not sure yet, right? Uh, I'm, I've read a piece on Tagore and caste, uh, which is not deep enough. And it's high time we do. I think probably we need to understand that. So Tagore as a Brahmin, and, you know, background, what did he do? Did he frontally, I'm fully not sure yet. Um, apart from condescending to untouchable situation and so on. I'm not, so this is what Germans did, you know, Tagore, you know, there was critical intervention on German too. Look at the comments the Germans made on Tagore. The German speaking press was by no means unanimous in its praise. There were three major points around which the criticism of the press evolved. One, Tagore, a Hindu, wanted to influence Christians in their faith and ultimately convert them to Hinduism. That's one kind of German take of Tagore. The second was German writers deserved a slice of the Indian writer's enormous fame as they were no less talented and relevant in their writing. Okay, that's another. And the third is Tagu's seeming oriental lethargy, bloodlessness, Indian mildness was inimical to German or European dynamism, to its action-oriented mindset. So this was some of the condescending way they treated even Tagu after inviting him, right? So so, but for us, it's important as Tagore, like I have written, examining Tagore and Brahminism and casteism, um, we need to really explore, okay? Long way to go. We, I don't know whether is there any serious uh, dissertation on Tagore and caste and Tagore and Brahminism, Tagore and patriarchy, caste, and Brahminical patriarchy. Please try to think about it. Okay, this is how Tagore was carried in Germany when he visited in the 30s. Not bad, right? I mean, the Germans were really kind to him in some way. Um, that's Tagore. Anyway. So now that's, I mean, on the same time, you have this Brahmin male power flourishing, rise of Brahmin during the colonial period. This I quote is from C.J. Fuller's and Kharipriya Narasimhan's uh, work called Tamil Brahmins, The Making of a Middle Class uh, Class, 2014. Page 10. And look at this. In the, in all the three modes of enforcement come together in this quote. That's why I keep it. The provincial civil service examinations between 1892 and 1904 15 out of 16 successful candidates were Brahmins. 
Prime Minister at the time were not even 3%, I guess. Imagine, 97% of population was put aside. In 1930, 93 of the 128 permanent district municipalities, local villages were Brahmins. 93 out of 128. Compared with 21, 25 non Brahmins and 10 non Hindu groups. Okay. In the Madras High Court, four of the five Indian judges were Brahmins. Four of the five. Right? Let's ask what about the Supreme Court today? What are the cost groups and so on? Please find out. I do not know. Check it out. So by 1914, 650 registered graduates of the Madras Indian um, um, of the University of Madras included 450 Brahmins, only 124 non-Brahmins, 74 other communities. 11 out of 12, 11 out of 12 elected fellows of the university were Bra also Brahmins. 11 out of 12. Okay. Colonial, you see how colonialism favored Brahmin male power? That's why I titled this way, The Rise of Colonial Brahmin Male Power. Not only did these and other figures show that Brahmins dominated the government service and the university, but the same group also dominated the nationalist movement. For 15 out of 16 members elected from Madras to the All India Congress Committee were Brahmins, and only one a non Brahmin. Right? Imagine the domination. So, this is the quote from C.J. Fuller and Harik Priyan. Please do read the book. You will understand. Probably this. this he, so, you have, they control the government. They are, there are civil societal Brahminical ideas are in there. They control the academy, university. That's how during the colonial power more than 100 years ago. Okay? Right? It's 1914. Now, after 100 years, like Riti was saying, it's been 73 years since we became republic. What's happening in um, the universities of Bengal, brothers and sisters? What's happening in Delhi? What's happening in Tamil Nadu? We got to ask this question, whether colonial situation of Brahminical power, male power has come to an end or not. What's happening with our IITs? IAMs, please do, do such on that. Um, so post-colonial situation. I'm using a sociologist here. M.N. Srinivas' famous, famous work called Religion and Society Among the Kooks of South India. This was published in 1952. I went through this book again for this presentation. So here are some of the quotes. So he uses this, all India communities have been subjected to Sanskritization. Subjected to. But who did it? He doesn't talk about. Your homeless bronchus will help is the Brahmin male power which helped to this, into Sanskritization. By the way, the M.S. Universe wanted to use Brahminization. That's why he used the word Brahminization. It comes from him. And then he gave up and used the word Sanskritization. Okay? Uh, probably because he himself was a Brahmin, people would really corner him. So instead, I think he chose an easier uh, path called Sanskritization. Anyway, so, but he doesn't talk about who subjected the non Brahmins into Sanskritization. That's a major flaw. And he would never be forgiven by the forthcoming sociologist of that. Then the structural basis of Hinduism, and then he talks about this quote, the structural basis of Hinduism is the caste system. I appreciate him for this. So that means you cannot deal in caste from Hinduism. You pull the pillar of caste, there is no Hinduism. By the way, Hinduism is not even, was not even a popular word by early 20th century. By 1900, it was not even popular. I grew up as a child figuring out what this term is. My parents could not explain to me, right? So, but yet it was. So, so by the way, it was invented and put together only in the late 18th century, right? And becomes a little bit here and there in some, in some text by the late 19th century. Let's be clear. And so, so, but the caste has been there for long. It's a pillar of Hinduism. Eman Srinivas says that. And of course, the hierarchy system. So just look at this binary. You know, the hierarchy will be the Brahmin and untouchable at either end. That represents a fusion of Sanskrit and non-Sanskrit non system of rituals and beliefs. Does he have problem with this hierarchy or not? He doesn't seem to be. The very creation of the word untouchability. Yesterday I read an article called Touch. How in this COVID-19 situation, touch has come to, uh, how uh, reduction of touch between people has affected the psychology. We humans are meant to touch each other, not necessarily sexually all the time. We have to shake hands. We need to share food. We need to hug each other, not necessarily again in the sexual sense. 
right? But here you go, how could the Brahminical power invent something called untouchability? We need to philosophize on that. They, they, they were so cruel to create an, the concept of untouchability. And here you go, the sociologist called Emman Srinivas nicely legitimizes the Brahmin and untouchable as if they are unproblematic categories. Okay, so that's what I see. I have deep problems with it. You know, Indian sociologists, most of them have succumbed to this model and it's a deep, deep problem still till today. Another thing, and here is the thing, another, another quote from Emman Srinivas, unsuccessful attempts have been made to overthrow the caste system. Okay, so unsuccessful, whatever efforts were made by women and men, even Brahmin women would have tried. He says unsuccessful, complete failure. That means very legit. He doesn't talk about why it was. How does he say sweepingly it was unsuccessful, right? How how did Ambedkar, for example, emerge in uh, out of this whole lot of nonsense? Probably the most educated Indian at that time, with multiple PhDs. How did he do it? So so people have resisted, broke free. All that they have done, right? Gone up to Columbia University, New York, and have a PhD. People such as Ambik, right? How did they do it? So, and he calls all of them unsuccessful. No, it's not the case. So, but he does that anyway. So then, then the greatness of he says the greatness of Sanskrit literature. Bring in Johannes Bronkers and compare with Bram with, with three new ones. Here he celebrates said the greatness of Sanskrit literature and the vitality of Indian philosophical thought in Sanskrit have also contributed to the increasing importance of Sanskritic Hinduism. Sanskritic Hinduism, Brahminical Hinduism in other words. So he was legitimizing Brahminization, Sanskritization and so on. And then another quote, the adoption of vegetarianism, teetotalism and Sanskritization enables a lower, lower, low cost to raise in status in course of time. I have serious problems with it. Who's going to give up a vegetarian? Who is going to become? We are not going to become vegetarians, all of us. Imagine telling our Bengali, Bengali first, don't eat fish. There will be third world war. Am I right? So we eat, we eat vegetables, but we are not vegetarians in for the sake of caste reason, right? Teetotalism and sense. The moment you do all this, I say, you know, a lower caste is going to become an upper caste. Has it ever happened? So he's fictionalized, his legitimized Sanskritization as if all the lower caste, a other can never be equal to a, you know, a Sharma or something, right? We know that. And we know what these labels play a crucial role in the way one legitimizes, right? So here comes a sweeping statement from a sociologist, pioneering sociologist. The moment you become a vegetarian, the moment you don't drink alcohol, the moment you some, um, you know, muttering and uh, stammering of uh, Sanskrit, you are going to be an upper caste. But the first of all, I should ask you, do you want to be in a caste? I should ask. So Srinivas in a way legitimizes, there is no other way. You cannot live as a caste-free person. This is what the sociologist says in other words. You have to be Sanskritized, you have to be Brahmanized to be Indian. Is this the case? So we need to think about it, right? So it's a problem. And finally, he says this, Kurds regard themselves as Indo-Aryans. That means descendants of the original Indo-Aryan immigrants into India. You see, Srinivas accepts that there were immigrants, Indo-Aryan immigrants, and there are many groups such as groups which have descended. Everybody is clamoring to hold on to that. No, not many of us in South India or in Bengal or elsewhere in Jharkhand. No, clearly nobody wants to hold on to this Indo-Aryan Sanskritized path to be Indian to be a Bengali, to be a Tamil, to be a Jharkhandi, right? So to be a Bundelkhandi, to be a Odia, right? Not necessarily. So this is a, this is a sad imposition from Emman Srinivas. So that way, the post-colonial, we have, we saw a colonial Brahminical power surging with the, by colluding with the colonialists, collusion between colonialism and casteism. That's colonial time. Now in the post-colonial time, we have, um, uh, post what I call post colonial Brahmanization is flourishing, right? Why are now Indian, uh, Indian, European, and North American academy now it is complete, okay? Spivak, Gayatri Spivak, the Chakrati Spivak sits at Colombia. So when she came, I didn't even say hello to her, be a mood away because these people never wrote against casteism. 
Deepesh Chakravarti sitting in Princeton, no, not Princeton, in Chicago. Recently, I read an article, it's available in the net, how um, Deepesh Chakravarti you know, attempted to molest or something, some of his own students. It's out right now. And his own wife also sexually exploited the Muslim student by pointing out caste. It's out. Please do check. So these are some of the things people have done. Um, more than that, what do they have intellectually contributed? Right? What have they done? Again, there's no one book from these intellectuals, particularly Bengali intellectuals abroad. Why there is no work on, say, Bengali Brahminism or casteism? It has to be written, right? At least I say this, hereafter they would attempt. That's my interest. Um, hopefully they are anti-caste, I'm not sure yet. Hopefully they are caste-free, I'm not sure yet. They have to try, uh, for, you know, from their own experience. Okay, that's one. And then, after all this, we have deep resistance against casteism and Brahminism, which some of us are yet to understand. We are beginning to scratch. Okay, so the histories of caste-free Indian men and women, they are yet to write. But there have been some indices. In, in what are they? So we have Buddhism has been a very powerful tradition. Okay, uh, Buddhism and its denomination, they spoke about ethical humanism, rationalism. Buddha was anti-God because Brahminism flourished on talking about higher realms, right? We saw from home, Johannes Broncos, higher realms, which was fiction. We could not see it. Buddha asked, show me, show me, then I will believe. So the, the Brahmin male power was utilizing um, concept of God and goddesses to legitimize cause. Buddha had a problem, we know it now, and he was questioned. Okay, so gender women, uh, uh, they're also part of his tradition, we know that. And interestingly, vernacular Buddhist movements, Bengal had a Buddhist movement for a long time, probably no other reason, somehow held on to Buddhism um, as much as was in Bengal. Please find out about books, you know. Um, uh, even after the Mughals came in, Bengalis were holding on to the uh, cost free Buddhism, I guess. So we need to pick up that history. So, regionalized, what I mean by vernacular, is vernacular ling regional linguistic traditions, Buddhist movements came about, came about even outside South Asia. And then we have vernacular Christianity, vernacular Islam. Islam has been there in India from 711, right? From 711 common era. Christianity for more than 2000 years. We know that St. Thomas and all that tradition in Tamil Nadu and elsewhere, right? So there is this vernacular Christianity, vernacular Islam, likewise Bengali Islam. We need to uh, think about it. In one of the talks in, uh, my Bengali friends organized a few months ago, I said that, what is the contribution of Muslim brothers and sisters to the very evolution of Bengali language? We only talk about Bhadrao, deeply problematic. What about Bengali Christianity? What about Tamil Islam? In Tamil Nadu, where I come from, Muslims played a very crucial role in the evolution of Tamil language. Thankfully, we have pioneering, pioneering Islamic scholars. Tamil Islam, they don't know Arabic. They don't know Urdu, but they were masters of Tamil, and we are grateful to them. I was influenced in my Tamil by Nagur Hanifa, right? His songs, it's very emotional for me, you know? So that way, how to pronounce Tamil, I got to know from Nagur Hanifa. Thankfully, I had this childhood. So that way, it's very important to talk about vernacular Islam. And vernacular caste-free cultures, religion, so non-Sanskritic cultures we need to dig about. Uh, so vernacular discursive and not, let me work on in a, in a discursive. What is discursive? So verbality, verbalization, textual, words, that's discursive. But people are also creating manually things. That's non-discursive, right? They may not speak, but they create a tool, a food invention. So they are non-discursive traditions. Um, so, so discursive, non-discursive traditions of women, do we know? How women have been creating things, their ideas, their inventions, do we care? So how do we understand, say, women during Mughal, Mughal rural women, um, you know, say, three centuries ago, four centuries ago, okay? Um, so there are Sanskrit scholars who tell us we don't even know the Brahmin women history beyond a couple of centuries because it's all dominated by Brahmin males, right? So there are so people talk about um, uh, Sanskrit, uh, Sanskritists uh, and point out even Brahmin women's history have been dehistoricized. So we need to do that. So that's why the ancient, medieval, modern, caste cultures have been dehistoricized. We need to, and, and it's been done through adaptation and uh, emulation of Brahmin uh, power and so on, and and, and anti-caste uh, cultures and histories have been suppressed. Okay, so 
Do I have an example to talk about resistance? So this is what my, my doctoral work on Ayodhidas. He was a Buddhist. He was a pioneer in this what I have. He was a pioneer of modern anti-caste Buddhism in India. He lived with me in 1914. And he initiated this movement, Buddhist movement in modern India, much before Ambedkar and others. Ambedkar learned this Buddhism from Thas and the Tamil Buddhist movement. The core of Tamil Buddhism was not to just ritualize Buddha. No, they didn't even bother about his statue. Instead, they picked up the humanistic elements, the anti-caste elements. Imagine where Brahminism is, there cannot be humanism. Because when the moment I declare myself as a Brahmin, I am going to de you know, sort of dehumanize you in some ways by calling you non-Brahmin. Right? And if I'm a Brahmin male and then I want to ridicule you as a, you know, even though you may be a Brahmin woman, still you are not equal to me, right? So there is no humanism. But Buddhism has, and that's what Tas said, Tamil Buddhism is meant for human, it's anti caste, caste free movement, please come in. So many men women joined. It was, so caste free modernity in India comes from Tas in a big way. Caste free modernity in India, right? Um, comes from Tas. So we need to engage, some of us are beginning to do that. Look at, he ran a weekly called the Tamilan. It means no caste surname here. Note that, please. The very word got popularized from this weekly, the Tamilan, which means the Tamilian. I'm a Tamilian attached to no caste. I'm caste free. I'm an anti caste person. So that's how you are speaking. And anyway, speaking like a Bengali, no caste attached. I'm just a Bengali, the Bengali, something like that, right? So the weekly Tamilian, there he raised this. He wrote articles saying, who is human? What is a nation? Ladies column. There was a special column where women were writing. This is between 1907 and 1914, brothers and sisters. Women were writing. And they were writing about sexuality. Right. Okay. So you force, for example, uh, quickly, uh, you force a 15-year-old girl uh, uh, to be a widow. Do you think she will keep quiet? She will fall in love have a baby and kill that baby and fall in love again because you're not allowing her to get married to a lover, right? The religious groups. That's what is happening in UP, right? How many couples are fearing right now? People who fall in love. Every Indian damn movie is about love, but when any men and women fall in love, we go around and kill. That's what our distinguished sadhu in UP does. That. How many villagers are scared right now? How could you do this? Are you human? You are having a sadhu dress, right? A saintly dress. But are you truly humanistic? Please decide me, um, brothers and sisters. I leave it alone. So, uh, Thas raises when ladies, and then Bengali Congress. He called the Indian National Movement as a Bengali National Movement because Bengali male Brahmins were dominating. He called this Brahmin Congress. This was in 1891, just six years after the Indian National Congress was formed. Thas was attacking it as, oh man, all of them are Brahmins. The 95% of Indians don't have any connection with it. Therefore, he was attacking and he used the word pseudo Brahmins, all that they do, nice, very good, very bold. And then he talks about how the Brahmin women and men can easily get married or live with a white person. But uh, inter caste marriage is, is wrong. People have got to go around and do the what is called caste murder, which also goes by the phrase uh, honor killing, right? So he talked about how Brahmin folks were dilly dallying with whites at that time. This was 100 years or more ago. What is happening now? Do you know any Indian who's married to a, an African American man or a woman, or a, you know African um, British man or a woman? Please find out. I, I, you know, most of the academics they all have you know Brahmin white folks marriage. So this has to be questioned. Hopefully, things become better. Um, Ajanta Subramanian, the anthropologist at, uh, at Harvard University, is an is a, an Indian, uh, and she has married an African American. She's the first academic that I know who has married an African-American man. And she has come out with a, a recent book, you know, um, The Cast of Merit. Powerful book, please read. Talks about IITs and the casteism in IIT today. Please read the book, Ajanta Subramanian. Anyway, so that way the marriage one has to be alert. And then of course, the con he uh, attacked ideas of, uh, you know, paria, um, the term to insult people. Untouchability is a Brahminical invention. He attacked that. And then he said, you have to pay for it. You have invent, in, insulted a large majority of Indians in the name of caste, and you need to pay. Well, that's where the concept of ref, reparation and affirmative action comes into, um, all these concepts come into being. Affirmative reservation. So the roots of reservation, he talked about reservation. Why Brahmins dominate these institutions? 
not more than four fellows, he said, should be from these cups. Others have to participate. So in a way, in Tamil Nadu, um, the pioneer of affirmative action, probably in modern India, he would have been one of the first few to talk about affirmative action, to clear off the um, the few Brahmins, I mean, the few percentage of Brahmin folks who were dominating almost all the jobs, asking them to move away and let others to come in, the non brahmin folks to come in. Tas was a pioneer in that, okay? There's a long way to go still. IATs are not for others. It's still controlled by the uh, privileged few Brahmins, by the way. So, so Paray said, he said, who are Paray? He said, those who spoke against caste and so on, all that. And anyway, so so this is some of, and by the way, with all this movement, there were Tamils who declared themselves as Buddhists uh, in 1911 census, called themselves only Buddhists and Indian Buddhists. So that was this case. This was Thas, um, as a pioneer of Antigua's movies, uh, it's available in the net and so on. Um, so he published the journals. Okay, so Thas, okay, good. And then, by the way, some of these people also moved out of India through the endangered policy from 1934, our Indians. And most, and, and this is what I call immigration against caste. They broke free. They said, held in this place, I cannot escape from casteism. Is there a way to explore this outside India? So they took to this Indian, uh, uh, you know, indentured policy from 1934 and emigrated against caste. Emigration, not immigration. Okay, they clearly moved away. That's why I call it as immigration against caste. And I'm doing field work with our, some of our Indians who, have, who, who moved around this time. And from 1838, they are there in Guyana, Suriname. I went around, met with them, interviewed them. And many of them were from the marginalized groups, such as so-called antidepressants and lower caste, because hard labor has to be done in plantations, right? Imagine a Brahmin male cutting a sugar cane. How many of them would do? Because these guys have been sitting and doing some textual work, sample and so on. But the hard labor was forced on the poor and the marginalized, right? So they were recruited by the British to run the plantations. Okay, they were in hospitable conditions. People were dying out of malaria, right? Horrible, horrible. Even in Guyana, when you go to the forest, it's, it's mosquitoes can kill you. So you have to be very careful. I was warned. Um, so, so, but when they moved out, they got emancipated. That's what I say in this. So after going there, they became caste free. And so they were remembering and religious. So they created their own, they took their gods from say Tamil Nadu and Bengal elsewhere. See, there's some other gods they use, Kali, Kateri, Sipari Mai, Sangili Murugan, Muni, Madurai Viran, Mariamman, and so on. These are the gods and goddesses of the casteless people in the Caribbean now celebrated. Everybody goes in and, and, and these caste free Tamil rituals, animal sacrifices are done. A pig is cut, a goat is cut, or a chicken is cut, you know, a fowl is cut, and then community, community fees are there, right? They do that. And by the way, there are priestesses. There are women who are priests there, right? We are yet to see a woman doing puja in our temples. There are thousand, close to thousand temples in America. We are yet to see a Brahmin woman becoming a, uh, um, a uh, 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 priestess because she menstruates, right? How could you be menstruate and then, you know, and then still, did the God say? Did the goddess say? So there are articles in the Caribbean how um, Indians, some Indians who identify themselves as Brahmins, who imposed menstrual restrictions on women and not allowing them in temples. Who? Imagine. The gods don't say, but the, the castes men say. So please read up about that. So thankfully, in some of this anti-caste tradition of the Caribbean, women are uh, uh, conducting temple rituals. I saw them. And, and then they are interracial. African descendants in Guyana go into our Kali temples, Mariamman temple, Sangli Murugan, they pray, they cut coconut, they cut uh, some animals and have community peace and so on. So these, these deities are seen as psychosomatic healing gods and goddesses directly related with them, um, dark in color and so on. Imagine, imagine, imagining, uh, imagine a ram and dark in color. It's not possible, right? So, but thankfully, there are these gods of the caste free um, that I could see in the Caribbean, as is the case in interior Tamil Nadu, probably in Bengal too, right? Kali, uh, non brahmanical uh, Kali traditions in Bengal we need to explore. Anyway, so that way the present I'll wind up in. Uh, uh, so the present and future of casteless and gender free societies, right? Um, we don't have a clue. It's only the future. We never had a casteless India. We never had a gender-free society in India. It's all in the future, present and future, and we all have to work toward that. All of us have to work. So there is this decasteization we need to do. That means you, you really throw away the caste 
aspects of all kinds. Okay, so private and public undoing of caste and gender beliefs and practices at all levels. Every man has to do what a woman does. Every woman has to do what a man does. So that way we need to do that, right? Our, we have to bring up our children, right? Cleaning, everything, and, and things like menstruation and so on. It's just normal, as simple as that. Like when I cut, this is what, you know, female unit, the book, you know, German, um, um, uh, this book, female unit taught me, right? My blood is like in like, similar to men's blood and so on. Thankfully, I read like, as a graduate student, uh, undergrad student. So it, it kind of emancipated me in some ways to be normal and so on. Uh, to be present, I'm a postgraduate time I read this book. Anyway, so so um, the casteless and gender free cultural celebrations, music and dance, and all of them can then be caste free, non religious. We have to invent. Please do that. And immediately be attacked as Western and so on, not necessarily. Is there any way that we can do Indian dance and music tradition where all of us can come together? As of now, Hindustani and Carnatic traditions are caste based. Okay, uh, um, Uma Chakravarti was here, famous historian. I asked her, she came to speak on Carnatic music tradition on Bharatanatyam. I asked her, is there a possibility of Bharatanatyam or Carnatic music or Hindustani becoming common people's music and dance form? She said, no. It is, they are all dependent on cost. And she said, I'm almost beginning to give up all these traditions and I don't even watch, she said. Professor Uma Chakravarti, who I hold in very high regard for her standpoint on connecting cost and gender issue. Please read her work. Okay, so, so that way we have to create musical dance and uh, food system, meat and vegetables, all of them together where it will be decastizing, inclusive, as Riti was saying when she began, but, uh, you know, uh, giving up caste and being inclusive, right? Respecting and celebrating, recognizing human body, right? We have to uh, appreciate each other's body. Sexuality, we have to talk about, right? Now, some of the European children are trained to show what is about their body? How do you understand your body parts? How do you respect each other? So the, we need some, and the sexual interest. We never had this idea of LGBT a few years ago. Now we are talking about, which is good, right? And then there has to be a consensus. The, the other day I was talking to an American um, good friend of mine. Um, you know, how do we talk about cost and consensus, right? Is there anything, how do we critique cost through idea of consensus? Right, our movies and everything the aggressive sexuality, right? A male has to be aggressive, male cannot accept the no from a woman, right? That's how it is. But what do we do when philosophically we introduce the concept of consensus? That means, can I accept a no from my partner, sexual partner? Okay, so uh, am I prepared? So I think we need to train. So, concept of sexuality cost Kajiraho is an amazing place where. Men and women have sex with animals. It is there on Kajiraho, right? Same sex sexuality has been there. What, thousand years ago in Kajiraho temple? Please do see, I, maybe one of the talks I will do on this sexuality, I want to talk about. So that, that's one way uh, of uh, giving up caste, supporting interreligious, intercaste marriages, not like the Sadhu, what is he doing in UP, going around people butchering all in the name of legitimizing religious divisions and caste divisions and gender divisions, right? So, so, and then non temple based social interactions we have to do, right? Everything as of now, how, where do you go? I'm going to, on Tuesday I go to temples, on Friday I go to temples because I see a lot of people. It's nice feeling, right? Community feeling. What community feeling? Can we create our marriage? Is there any space where all of us can be without connecting ourselves with the religion or cause? I share your food, I share my food, you share your food. Let's eat together, dance together, touch together without sexualizing, exploiting each other. This is idealistic. I'm being romantic about No, it's doable. We have to create, right? When Michael Jackson or latest, you know, uh, latest singers and so on, when they perform, how do you react? You can't be quiet, okay? Kendrick and, uh, you know, Lama, when he does, you react, you listen. I do that with my son, right? So you, you it stimulates you. When Kigo, the instrumentalist from Norway plays, you, you react to it. So there are music, all of us can react, dance, all of us, we need to create. And then women leadership should be at the forefront, right? To lead, I think relatively problems are a lot less when women take the leadership. And we need to be open to that. We, everything, anything we do, okay? Um, religious, non-religious, cultural, I think we should put women at the forefront, the possibility of we becoming a lot more human is more, okay? Um, 
uh, uh, that's my understanding. So therefore, we consciously we need to dis dislodge caste and gender oppression and engage in everyday life, right? We need to engage in caste free, gender um, casteless and gender free everyday life. What could be? I don't have a clear idea. That means we need to question the way Mahabharata is being imposed on us, Ramayana, the religious things that we have in our room, right? Okay, what do we? What do they teach? Do they teach humanism, or do they impose hierarchies? If they are, if they, are if they impose caste hierarchy, gender hierarchy at home, the objects they consciously and unconsciously influence me. So I need to take them and throw them out. So we need to be casteize ourselves that way. If you want to be casteless, if you want to be caste free, if you want to be gender free, we love, we have a lot of things to clean up at home, and then in our interpersonal relationship. Okay, therefore, I'm talking about what is called critical caste studies. I'm, I'm initiating a new subfield called critical caste studies. Soon, my piece will be out on this. I'm also, my piece on critical caste feminism is going to be out. Uh, so, uh, probably you have something interesting to read on that. Interdisciplinary uh, critical caste studies I want. History, anthropology, religion, and religious, all of them come together, but focus on caste as a problem. No more like MRCD was legitimizing sanctification, Brahminization. Uh, it casteization, no more, right? We interrogate. So rejection of caste as a social political ideology, repudiation of caste policy, dualism, all that. You know, people talk about Dalitism, I have problems with. You know, they also say coming out as, as Dalit. I don't know what do they mean by Dalit. You know, Dalit means broken, okay? Uh, and, and, and I think that the time for this category is done. Can Dalit, category Dalit be legitimized across India to be uh, inclusive? I'm not sure. So they are cost, Dalits are cost free people. They are costless Indians, right? So what does this category Dalit do? I'm not sure. Okay, I should, any one of you say Riti, if she is a Dalit, should she be called as a broken woman? How long she is a Dalit? If, if Himadri is a Dalit, should he be called as a, a broken man all the time? No, not necessarily. Is there a point Himadri can become a costless person? Is there a point Riti can become a costless woman, cost free woman? And non dalit you know, clearly, in a breaking field. So um, I'm not sure about the, some of some of the brothers and sisters who are declaring that I have come out as a Dalit and so on. I have intellectually, politically, and culturally the positive cultural memory of such brothers and sisters are wiped out when they essentially want the category called Dalit. That's my thinking right now. Okay. So that way, so cast of uh, imposing categories of all kinds should be done away with. That's my, uh, instead we should embrace the vernacular. Uh, uh, we should imagine vernacular, casteless, gender-free uh, culture. So what would be the casteless, gender-free Bengali culture? Please don't tell me it was in the past. It was never in the past. We need to create one in the future. Um, I think I'll stop there. Fill them down. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for such an enriching lecture. Because mm -hmm. I think this was a necessary lecture, you know. I because yeah. unless we know the problems that are plaguing the society, how can we ever try to address them? Absolutely. So this was this was very necessary, I think. And and before we move on to the audience questions, I mm -hmm. have two questions myself. Please. Uh, okay. Uh, so my first question is. How are the institutions of racism and casteism complementary to each other in India that is creating a like, much more prejudiced system, a much more right. prejudiced society? Right. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'll note down. So, yeah, you're right. Um, very quickly, race and caste. Yeah. This is the thing um, I'm thinking about. It's a very category uh, varna refers to color, right? So it struck me. Um, how, why would they think about that means color based discrimination was legitimized for a long time in India. So, so the moment we say, I use the word race, most of us have been as students of history and social sciences and humanities. The moment the, moment the word is dropped, uh, the race is dropped, we think about Africa and African Americans, that's how. That is wrong. I think the Varna category, I think it, it sort of intellectually kindled me to think, right? Whoa, whoa, we have had the concept of Varna. That means who invented this? That somebody who identified uh, uh, himself as probably 
we use the word fair and color right for light skin so light skin person look down upon a dark skin person as inferior so i think that's where the origin origin comes we need to really push on this further right so the, so that way i see in a way caste and, and race uh, the color component are inseparable it's always there and that has its implications to today i was just thinking uh, probably this morning or yesterday i went to a temple in tamil nadu where that meant that goddess is supposed to help those who whoever prays to her would help with or him i forget who is he or she with you know unmarried people will get married that's the you know gods and you visit i go there many of them were dark skinned women i was in a shock i want to write an ethnographic piece on this because they were dark they were beautiful I'm, I'm, i'm not conscious please book it's a wrong usage they are all very fine women right good humans right only because their color is dark they are not eligible to get married how could you do this right so therefore the victim of uh, the fellow who were invented color immediately uh, put down his his own community women so, so there is a deep connection between race and cause for a long time i have not read a serious book on this. for example i think probably i'll write professor johannes bronkos and, and ask this question and can we think about you know cause and race in the ancient text how do we uh, unravel this and then the medieval ramification and then the modern that matrimonial column right we clearly say right yes. there yeah light skin people only have to apply acs and acs don't apply they are not humans you see so so that way the roots of it you need to dig deep um, but i don't have very clear reference to talk about say sanskrit text and so on but i see a deep connection i don't have to have uh, um, uh, of course uh, probably we this is what i think probably we have to understand how theories of race and practices of racism operate in the us we may have to have some we may have some clues to understand our own situation so there is it is necessary for us to understand um, uh, racial capitalism and racism in the us and see how brahmanical capitalism brahmanical exploitation the connection between varna and jati yeah i'll leave it at that yeah. okay so thank you thank you Absolutely. and uh, my next question is mm-hmm. what if do you think the mm-hmm. recent attempt of the hindutva politics which uh-huh. attempts to bring all castes under a uniform hindu yeah. order have on local dalit bahujan politics yes um this is what uh, thank you for asking this question ruthi um um this is what i understand uh, this is my general observation um based on what i read in the media and so on and this is what i understood right now the agenda is to recruit they want you to identify yourself in some caste and then give a piece of the cake right so they go in tamil nadu this is happening they want people to assert their caste and then i am um, you know dalit caste or within the dalit i am this caste and so yeah you identify yourself as this dalit caste not as a homogeneous dalit caste you know then i'll give you one mla shape or one mp shape that so they want the sanskritized mnc or sanskritization brahmanization the the structural basis like mnc was said, the structural basis this social political ideology you know johannes bronkus said this political social ideology need to be strengthened this hierarchy to be strengthened so that everybody would be recruited but the problem is the privileged groups will remain at the top and the lower ranks will remain at the lower level uh, the toilets will always be cleaned by our own brothers and sisters who we call as dalits and we will never let them become doctors or priests or priestesses engineers and the engineering and doctor medicine course are meant for only you know the iatians who are again from the privileged groups that has been going on this is what ajanta professor ajanta professor mentioned so that way there is a huge strategy behind hindutva to do this and just not hindutva law this is what i want to point out is easy to point out and attack only hindutva but i want to know what about the non hindutva political parties doing what about the dravidian parties brothers and sisters i want to know tamil nadu has a radical anti caste tradition from ayodhya das where he very clearly said caste and gender questions are inseparable so 100 years or more das put this idea of we just becoming just a tamil casteless tamil okay 
And likewise, Bengali foreigners would have been there, right? So when they have said that, what, what about the non-Hindu political parties and cultural traditions, which consciously and unconsciously legitimize, yeah, you are a Dalit, you are pitying, condescending, right? The Gandhian type. Even though, Riti, you are an untouchable, let me put my hand on you, and then you are low. Even though you are low, I put my hand on. You don't need my hand, Riti. Say, so please, sir, please leave me alone. I am equal to you. I have my own critical view, you would say. Now, so you see, that's so that way, Hindu was easy to point out, attack. But non-Hindu, the tradition also I'm concerned about. You know, such as political parties like DMK, ADMK, what do they do? Right? Even Dalit parties, what do they do? Do they break free? And the potential for Dalit political parties is more to question cause. And they have to reach beyond that to be inclusive. So put them anybody who is anti-caste market. So that way the potential is more. That's my take on Dalit Bhavitan. But I understand that anti-caste critic, but there is a step forward to push this further to be inclusive. Right? So the oppressor and the oppressor uh, oppressed have to come together. That means a Brahmin has to develop the Brahminical values. The oppressed also in the caste values should come together and see the possibility. I leave it at that. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. So now we can move on to the audience questions. Please. Okay, so the first question is from Devajati Mondol. Please. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for your lecture. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One, from the post partition period, mm -hmm. what does the caste impact in the yeah. social, economic, and political sphere of Bengal? Right, right. Um, in the okay. continue, continue that, please. I can combine also. Yeah. In the mm -hmm. modern day, Text in India, I mm. think one of the most debatable topics about caste is mm. the caste reservation. Yes. Right. Many say that all caste based reservation should be abolished. Mm. Many say not. Yeah. There are many different views of different people. Right. What is your personal view on this? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deba Jyoti, for asking this. Uh, well, let me begin the first question. Uh, let the question be there. I said so. It helps me to remember. And so, so post partition, I want to like this is what, you know. Um, we have had some very interesting tradition, particularly what I'm interested in that Jyoti Basu was there for so long. There is this radical communist tradition. What has happened to the problem of caste? I'm very curious. I've had my, some of my closest friends are Bengali friends. I studied with them from my undergraduate days in India. Very close. I'm still in touch with them. And I know they are anti-caste and so on. So this one side. So, but after all this communist tradition in Bengal, what is I mean, I think there is there are some friends of mine, intellectuals who are beginning to explore. There is this deliberate up attempt to sugarcoat the you know uh, Badrulo Brahminical situation as as if this is caste free, but is it actually the case? So the post partition uh, time, as far as the problem of caste is concerned, I don't think there is a clear clear elimination um, and removal of caste. Yeah, I think it is muted in some form. Uh, and it has legitimized itself in the post partition time. So it's high time for us to consciously address how is a Bengali village right now? What was the situation before partition and after partition? After the communist vote, right? So, so we need to ask, could we refigure, right? And what, what is happening in the education institution? So all this we need to raise to, uh, as of now, there is a sort of a romanticization of the Bengali. Um, Exclusiveness, you know. Um, there is, there is this. Uh, Kerala is different from other parts of India. Bengal is other. So that's how it is romanticized. That's not the case, right? Kerala is, after all, this powerful uh, communist movement still embedded in caste. Let's be clear, right? Many of my intellectual friends are attacking this, and they are good people. Likewise, in Bengal, we know, so the post partition time. We need to really, really dig, we should not romanticize. And if there are problems, we need to address this. And then the potential is there. These are the movements that have opened up the possibilities. We have to capitalize on that. Now, your second condition, or your question, I, I began my talk with this, right? The moment you say caste, yes, look at this, reservation has legitimized. Well, that's what I exactly wanted to interrogate the Jyoti, right? Uh, from my talk and the books I have referred, please read, you will get to know caste has been very virulent for a long time in ancient India, right? It has killed, mutilated, drawn people, it has disemboweled, killed people. Still people are getting uh, killed. So it's not reservation that led to their killing, right? So 
So that's what essentially my talk is about. There's been a long history. Don't blame reservation. Reservation is the right of the oppressed. And that is just a small piece of cake. Reservation is not fulfilled in the IITs, in IAM, in the presidency university, okay? In Madras University, it's not filled. Many departments hate non-Brahmin community people. I know this, we enough of records. Okay, uh, you know, the Professor Thorat and uh, Catherine Newman have uh, written a lot about this, and 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 and, and many others too, right? Uh, um, so that way, there are enough of work now to talk about how reservation has not been filled uh, well for the oppressed, and it is used as a ploy to legitimize casteism and Brahmin. So that I leave it at that, Joe, Joe, and reservation of the problem. There is there are more things to be filled in addition to. Okay, so the next question from Aditya Shankar Chattopadhyay. He asks, what was the role of Brahminism in the decline of Buddhism in ancient right. India? Right. As Buddhism was still predominant in various right. parts of the subcontinent right. till 10th to 11th century CE. Right. During 9th to 10th century CE, many of the Buddhist people right. turned to Brahmanic Hinduism, especially in Eastern India. Right. What made them migrate to the social structure of Brahminism? Right. Uh, first of all, I appreciate you for this question, Aditya. It's powerful. Um, so there's another romanticization that goes on within Buddhism. I said everything was perfect and so on. No, no there are texts which point out, no, there was, of course, women were, uh, you know, bhikshu or bhikkhunis were there. Women could take equal to all that. But it was not all the time easy. There were problems, right? So there is the one. So, but but the point is, the, the very clear historians tell us. In fact, Johannes Bronkers has also written about this: how Brahminism played a very vital in the very vital role in the very decline of Buddhism. So, so like I said in, the, in my talk, three components, right? So uh, the rulers, some of the rulers who were converted to even Buddhist rulers who were forcibly converted, or somehow fell for the Brahminical values rekindled Brahminical values and reculturalized, uh, uh, you know, re-Brahminized uh, many uh, pre-Buddhist tradition or Buddhist tradition, right? So that way, I think uh, there are many multiple factors that operate. Definitely some rulers uh, were bought into Brahminism, were brought in and bought into Brahminism. Therefore, uh, it kind of, uh, it, it, uh, it, it, it kind of uh, succeeded again over the Buddhist uh, interregnum that it had. In Tamil Nadu, for instance, in some of the Shaivite and Vaishnavite temples, there are still paintings, they are Buddhist. By the way, Tamil Nadu had a very long Buddhist tradition, ancient Buddhist tradition. The very first Tamil text in Tamil Nadu called Mani Megalai is about a Buddhist popular text, 5th mm. century, common era. So the very first Tamil major text is about Buddhist text, not Shaivite, not Vaishnavite. And so, and then when the Vaishnavite and Shaivite tradition came to be from the 9th century, 9th century Aditya, um, the Shaivites and Vaishnavites were not tolerating the Buddhists and Jains. They were killed very brutally. Some of these paintings tell us there's something called Karu Maram in Tamil. Karu Maram means sharpened wooden structure, right? And on top of that, Buddhists were taken, Jains were taken, and they were killed by, by this by the wooden thing, just poked them and threw their bowels and so on. Brutally killed, and paintings are still there. So that is how the Buddhists and Jains were eliminated by the Shaivites and Vaishnavites. So we have this violence, bodily violence, which also led to the elimination of non-Brahminical, non-caste, anti-caste traditions. Brutal bodily violence, right? When Manu legitimizes like how to cut a woman's tongue, how to cut a woman's breast, how to cut, a, you know, poke out the eyes of men because they fell in love and then they breach cars. When Manu Smriti legitimizes that, why would not ordinary men go around do this? Because your God has said this, do it. So that's how bodily violence played a very vital role in the elimination of Buddhism and the re brahminization and Brahminical Hinduism, Sanskritic Hinduism came into being in many parts. So, violence. And then the colonialists in modern era. So, I want you to read this book called uh, The British Discovery of Hinduism. 
like Peter Mar you know, uh, Marshall, right? Um, uh, the British discovery of Hinduism. This was written in 1971, powerful book. And then, so how the British, by interacting with the Bengali Brahmins in the second half of the 18th century, I'm very precise. I read this book again and again, I'm reusing it. Therefore, I'm saying, in the, in the, in the last half of 18th century, Bengali Brahmin males played a very damaging role in colluding with the British colonialists to produce texts. I'm talking about the Asiatic society, which was based in Kolkata. And they were churning out Brahminical male texts that legitimized in some way. So a new lease of life was created for Brahminical male texts from the second half of the 18th century, primarily to attack the Mughal tradition, which was a little more progressive. Right? So that way, I touch upon the ancient, medieval, and modern period by which the Brahmin, the, one of the colonialist legend, and then the census from 1871. You have cast was input in the census 1871 onwards. And British did it very calculated way. And the and privileged caste groups imposed that. And therefore, we have thereafter, with the colonialist, re Brahminization of India happens in a radical way. So that's another important comment. So I stop there. Thanks, Aditya. Prithviraj Mukhopadhyay mm -hmm. says, Sir, nowadays caste has become a major issue in politics. Right. Rajni Kothali, in his writing, asserted that caste mm -hmm. as an identity can play right. a role as a peculiar actor in contemporary Indian politics mm -hmm. and is antithetical to Brahminic Hindutva politics. Right. Considering this, what do you think about the potential of caste identity and caste as a secular resistance? Right. Um, and by the way, I met with uh, Rajini Kothari and doing my student life. I saw him in Delhi, Delhi giving lectures and then had a chat also one time. But the point is this, I disagree with this position, okay? Uh, this particular thing, caste identity can play a secular, uh, in, in, no, I disagree with him um, completely. This is how caste has been legitimized in our electoral politics, right? Uh, Riti asked about uh, the Hindutva. I what would Rajini, I mean, I'm sorry, Rajini Kothari would say to this, um, to this uh, standpoint on, you know, Hindutva caste politics, would he, would Rajini Kothari agree with Hindutva caste politics? What he said as secular has been taken for a big ride under Hindutva. What is secular there, right? So Rajini Kothari is time for us to tell has failed in this theorization like M. M. was did. I don't see any potential. So another point. Electoral politics as a way for anti-caste or caste-free society in India is another major problem. It cannot happen. It might happen. It might happen. Okay. It might happen a uh, uh, little bit. But I think the civil societal, like I said, civil societal movements are important. Vernacular movements are important to do away with casteism and to create present and future caste-free societies. Caste categories in any form will not be helpful. That's my submission. So, so that way, uh, uh, I disagree with this kind of a standpoint. I, in the last, in the 73 years, we have, we have, we, you know, the Indian electoral politics ha has legitimized uh, caste-based uh, identities and so on, which have to be, uh, which have to, uh, you know, come to an end. And then new kind of social political movements are the way forward, not just the electoral politics, as Rajini Kothari said. Thank you, Pooja Raj. The next question is from Rakesh De. Uh -huh. uh, thank you, sir, for the excellent speech. Oh, okay. My question is, what is the difference of the concept of caste among right. Tagore, Vivekananda, and Gandhiji? Right. Good one. So I, um, I will not be able to do justice uh, Rakesh to this question because I'm not a specialist on any of them. I only have uh, read a few books about each one of them. I would recommend some books for you to read. Um, uh, the, regarding Vivekananda and others, I was terribly demystified after me reading Dorati Figuera's work. It's called um, um, you know, Aryans, Jews, Brahmins. Okay, this was published in 2000. I repeat the author and the title, Dorati Figuera, and the title is called Aryans, Jews, Brahmins. Okay, and it has got a second part also of the title. 
but in my Dora Tifigura, she is a Sanskritist and easily readable. I use this book for my students here in Germany. Dhyanan Saraswati, Vivekananda, uh, Roy, Ram, 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 Ram Mohan Rai. All of them were completely exposed by Dorothy Figura. I never knew. Dhyanan Saraswati didn't even know good Sanskrit, but he was winning Sanskrit debates. So uh, Tilak, uh, his uh, costly tendency, Dorothy Figuera exposes. Vivekananda also is the case, how aggressive he, were, he was. So in a way, uh, so all these great figures, okay, and she demystifies us. And of course, Ambedkar and others also have written about. Tagore is one person we need to really engage. I have one piece that I've read, uh, which says about how Tagore always, you know, he was supposed to be one of those lower run Brahmins. But yes, he was from a very rich family, right? So, and, then, and therefore, so he had a very wishy-washy attitude towards caste. He, of course, he was sympathetic to so-called like Gandhi, untouch, you know, Gandhi was very favorable to untouchable, right? But here comes the theme. He was returning from a roundtable conference and there were Indians who he called as untouchables and Harijans. He had the guts to create the word Harijans. Who is he to create the word Harijan? right? Condescension, right? It was not created by the oppressed. Gandhi invented the word Harijan. Now you call somebody as Harijan, they will attack you. Please don't do that. That is a derogatory word, Harijan. Gandhi created it because he never had an anti-caste position. He was pro-caste. He was pro-caste, but he was pro-untouchable too. This is what I said, right? Riti, Riti is an untouchable, you are so low, yet I'll give some little bit of food. Why? She doesn't need me. She said, sir, would you be just human? I don't want you to ill treat me. That is the problem, right, Gandhi? That's a very, Tagore, I'm, I'm here to read, I'm, please do a research, create, write, take a topic. Tagore and Kastism, Tagore and Brahmin, what did he do on this? I want to know. Let's go into his text. And if there, is, there are problems, let's expose it. Let's do that. We need to dig deep. What did he do regarding Germany in, in, in England? When he, wherever he would have traveled, what did I do on this problem? Brahma Samaj, what did it do on this problem of casteism? Did it play a very equal role for women? Why didn't he give leadership for women in some ways? What was there? What, who are the anti caste women in Bengal? We need to dig up this history. We are on a position. So, so as of now, from a little bit of my reading, I find them deficient. So um, um, this is not to say that, you know they have to. They should have had this full theorization on the problem of caste. But I think religion dominated, romanticizing the past. You know, the golden age was the deep tragedy of these three people in some ways. Vivekananda did, Gandhi did. All of them held up a golden age. Tagore definitely did. That I read. There was a beautiful age, and that's a common point between Tagore and Gandhi. Both of them thought, you know, you know, there was a beautiful time caste would have been, everybody was doing their job, and all was, no, there was never a golden age like that. People were subjugated, dominated. So, but Gandhi and, and Tagore, and of course Vivekananda, had a romantic understanding that led to the tragedy of the philosophies. We need to really interrogate, and at the same time, who are the people who were disagreeing with Tagore? I want to know. Women and men. Who are the people who disagreed with Vivekananda? We know about Ambedkar Gandhi debate, and there are some crazy academics who legitimize Gandhi was a great son of India. Ambedkar was another great son of India. It's a sophisticated nonsense. Don't do that. Right? Clearly, Ambedkar did not disagree with Gandhi. Okay? So there is no equation of between Ambedkarite, Ambedkar, uh, Ambedkarist humanism or Ambedkar's humanism uh, with Gandhi. I don't know whether he had genuine anti-caste humanism. So don't compare. So Ambedkar was a pioneering humanist. Gandhi was not. He was a condescensionist, if I can create a word like that. He was condescending all the time to women and, and men and all that. And sexual, imagine Gandhi's experiment of his sexuality. My student did the dissertation on that. Him staying naked, there are five women naked. What the bloody hell wanted to prove? What did he want to prove? 
If I am with a woman naked, I should be sexually aroused. And she would be aroused. And I have to respect that body equally. Right? That is what we become naked for. Suppose if I'm ill, if I have an accident, I'm naked, you guys are supposed to take care of me, right? Not in the yeah, my body, that's what a doctor would do. That's what I should do to you, right? The where is that humanism? What what Gandhi Gandhi what was he trying to do with the five naked women? Atrocious. He wanted to prove, look, even though there are naked women, I will not get arrows, I'll be what? So what? So that moment is horrible. He insulted those five women. I cannot agree with as a man. Right? It's not, I'm a heterosexual male. I have my problems. I understand that. Right? Um, so, but yet, so these are the major problems. These guys, we need to be clear. We need to think about it. Yeah. Thanks, Rakesh, for asking. We have one last question Please. from Devoshi Moitro. Yeah. He asked, What is the reason for less caste discrimination in Bengal than in yeah. other states of India? Yeah, thank you for asking. This is what Devoshi, I, um, Visibly, I, I fully agree with you. For example, in UP, uh, what's a brutal body violence? I think it's one of the, likewise in Tamil Nadu, brutal world bodily violence in Tamil Nadu of all places where we have had, and Bengal never had forefront anti class movement, right? We don't have, but in, in, in Tamil Nadu we had because of caste. So people were on the street fighting against caste. They clearly moved casteists away. There were inter caste marriages in the early 20th century. Right? Some Brahmin men married Muslim women in the early 20th century Tamil Nadu. So these are all great. But right now, in Tamil Nadu, terrible bodily violence are done in the name of Dravidian ideology because people were questioning caste. Right? So, but in Bengal, we never had that kind of an anti caste movement because communist movement was not anti caste movement. Let's not romanticize. Right? Why didn't we have a, a, an Adivasi as a communist leader in Bengal? Please tell me. Why didn't we have a Dalit as a, ben, a communist leader in Bengal? Please tell me. Why are you only Boshus? Please tell me. So that way we can do this unconscious legitimization of consumerism, the romanticization is going on. I know there is less bodily violence in Bengal, but Bengal, we should not romanticize. Till the last woman is free from caste. No society in Tamil Nadu is free from casteism and Brahminism. Let's get that clear, brothers and sisters. There's no Tamil Nadu is not free. Kerala is not free. Bengal is not free. Yes, we can relatively speak. Oh, we don't do this kind of a killing. But what do we do? Kerala, a, a woman could not enter Ayyappan temple, brothers and sisters. You know that. You know the video, a woman was videographing crying. That's my sister. Meaning, I was not born, but I connect with her. Imagine pain she, the pain she would have gone. She was filming when she was being insulted and she was crying, but she was not supposed to enter Ayyapan. Did Ayyapan God say? Or the Brahmin men say? Right? So, so that way, that was Kerala. Like this Bengal, please record and expose this. And so, we, less and more, more or less, let's not talk about it. We want caste-free Bengal. We want gender violence-free Bengal. A woman should walk comfortably at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, midnight, without fearing that somebody would violate her and kill her. In Kolkata, please let me know if that is a scene in Kolkata. In Bombay, yes, I have seen it. I have traveled in a railway compartment where some girls were free in the, in, in the midnight. Right, so that way, so uh, the less aspects, bodily, I understand. Communist movement had a, some role in it, other religious movements and so on, writers' movement and all that. I welcome that, but the the it, we have a long way to go in in really um, creating a caste-free Bengali society in the present and future. It's a challenge for all of us, right? I don't have a clear idea yet. Okay, so thank you. That that was our last question. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you so much for giving us so much time and answering all of our questions so patiently. Sure. This, this lecture was a necessary lecture for all of us thank because we need, to, we need to address these these problems and right. we need to know we need to celebrate our differences too, and we need to create a more inclusive society in order to create. This is our responsibility, sir. Absolutely. So, uh, so, 
lecture was really a stepping stone for that. Thank you so much, sir. And more research also needs to be conducted in, in these areas because uh, it's much less researched and less talked about, especially in yeah. India, Absolutely. especially in the country of origin. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you. It has got to be done. Very good. Yeah. Thank you for thank you for organizing uh, um, this lecture. It is a lot of uh, back and forth. Himadri, I also thank Himadri. He was very patient in communicating. And um, I know you guys even had class today you know, on the Republic Day. That's so funny. Uh, and you've got that and uh, amazing. I really appreciate. And there is, I think, uh, we don't know each other, but you located me somehow. So I don't know um, how you did. And, but, but the thing is, I think that this is this uneasiness in you which led to this. And I appreciate that I welcome. And it's a challenge for us. Uh, all of us have that responsibility. We have to do it. Good. Yeah, I'm very happy to have participated in your group. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you to all of our supporters. We yeah. have an upcoming lecture on 31st January by Dr. Shruti Kapila. So please follow us more. And thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Riti. Take care. Bye-bye. And thanks, so everyone, thank for you. participating. And I appreciate all your questions. OK? Thanks, um, Himadri, too. Bye-bye.